p.m. on August 19th. Today, we have a trio of infectious disease experts and two health administrators to talk about how the Delta variant has really changed our fight uh, against the COVID-19, the virus that causes COVID-19. First of all, we're gonna start off with Dr. Louis Katz. He's the medical director at the Scott County Health Department. Uh, Brooke, can you enable screen sharing and I'll show the epidemic curve. Okay, trying out these. All right. Is that working? Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the epidemic curve updated today for Scott County. Um, the curve for Rock Island County is essentially uh, the same. The numbers are a little different, but essentially the same. We've passed 26 cases per 100,000 per day in Scott County, uh, and that's uh, 13 times the best we did on 2nd or 3rd of July. Test positive rate is 13%. 14 day average It's actually higher than that now, but 13% over the last uh, two weeks, uh, which is 10 times the rate on uh, July 2nd or 3rd bef before the holiday. So I think you can see from the shape of the curve at the far right, we're going the wrong direction. Uh, again, more than 10 times higher than where we were. You'll hear more about hospital admissions that have increased markedly nationwide, and you'll uh, get a feel for local um, um, numbers uh, uh, from Kurt and, uh, and others on the call. Uh, clinical capacity has already exceeded Florida, Texas, across the Gulf Coast generally. We're not there yet, but we're getting close. Uh, there is uh, relatively new evidence that immunized people are having breakthrough infections. It's gotten a lot of media coverage. I want to make a, just a couple, three points about that. Breakthroughs are both expected and important. The current evidence says that vaccination during Delta, during Delta, reduces the risk of infection, presence and multiplication of the virus by 50 to 60%. That compares to above 70% for the prior variants. So uh, we're, we're seeing more breakthroughs, but the vaccines are still uh, very effective. The large majority of vaccinees who have breakthrough will not get sick or require care. And the large majority of nationwide hospitalizations, ICU admissions and deaths are in the unvaccinated. Delta is the current variant. It's not the last. And we need to think in those terms uh, as we develop our ongoing responses. While the emergence of an individual variant is not predictable, we do know that the more infections occur, the more variants will arise. That's one of the reasons that horrid epidemic curve uh, makes us uh, so nervous. Immunization which continues to substantially reduce infection rates is the best way to prevent emergence of variants. Additional doses will be needed of vaccine for those who don't respond well to the primary series. And you've heard about that in the media over the last week with particular attention to people with compromised immune systems. Boosters will be recommended probably for everyone in late September, that depends on FDA clearance. And that's because we have very early evidence that the duration for which the current vaccines protect from illness and hospitalization are falling somewhat. Reformulated vaccines may be needed to address future variants. Um, excuse me, future variants. If you're looking for a vaccine, vaccine.gov is a good place to go. And the two health departments have vaccination programs in progress that I'm sure you'll hear more about. Masking of all in indoor spaces, whether vaccinated or not, and social distancing, particularly indoor, indoors, while we increase vaccination, remains critical uh, to protecting the unvaccinated and those who won't respond properly uh, to vaccination. High vaccination rates and lots of masking 
uh, protect healthcare capacity, protect those who cannot be immunized or will not respond well to the vaccine. Please remember, my shot protects you, your shot protects me. Uh, I think that's our critical uh, message and that's all I had to say. And I, you want me to stop sharing now, Brooke? I stopped sharing for you, thank you. <laughs> Want to make sure they can get some shots of you as well as you were speaking. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from Nita Ludwig, the administrator with the Rock Island County Health Department. Good afternoon. Starting next week, the Rock Island County Health Department will offer a third vaccine dose to the severely immunocompromised people, as recommended by both the CDC and the Illinois Department of Public Health. The Moderna vaccine is given each Tuesday and the Pfizer is offered on Fridays at the health department here at 2112 25th Avenue in Rock Island. The vaccine clinic walk-in hours are nine to noon, and then again, one to 4 p.m. both of those days. There are two important things to note, and that is that um, this is for the severely immunocompromised people. They must bring their vaccination card with them to receive that third dose so that we can see when they have their other two doses. And qualifying patients also can receive their third dose from any provider, not just the health department. And to find your shot, visit vaccines.gov. So you can go to one of the local pharmacies that are offering those Moderna or Pfizer vaccines as well. At this time, only people that meet the following criteria will be offered that third dose. Um, they have been either receiving active cancer treatment for tumors or cancers of the blood, received an organ transplant and are taking medications to suppress the immune system. They are receiving a stem cell transplant within the last two years or are taking medication to suppress the immune system. Or they have moderate or severe immunodeficiency such as De George syndrome or Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. They uh, may have an advanced or untreated HIV infection, or they have active, active treatment with a high dose corticosteroid or other drugs that suppress the immune system. Patients should talk to your, your healthcare provider about their medical condition and whether an additional dose is appropriate for them at this time. At this time, the health department and our healthcare and pharmacy partners are not offering the third doses to people outside of that criteria. The CDC announced this week that the vaccine doses for the general population for third doses should begin sometime in September. General population patients should receive their third dose eight months after that second dose was done. The health departments and our healthcare partners are working on plans for this next phase in the vaccination effort. And we will share that information through these briefings, um, through our media partners and our social media as well when those plans are finalized. These third shots only apply to the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, which is Pfizer and Moderna. So this does not apply to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine at this time. Medical studies are ongoing to find out whether a booster shot will increase protection with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Our top priority remains staying ahead of the virus and protecting our residents from COVID-19 with safe, effective, and long-lasting vaccines. The virus is constantly changing and we are following the science. Vaccines remain the most powerful tool that we have against COVID-19. If you haven't been vaccinated yet, you should get vaccinated right away. Almost all of the cases of severe illness, hospitalization, and death are occurring among those that are not vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nita. Um, next, we have Dr. Kurt Anderson, the Senior VP of Physician Operations and CMO with Genesis Health System. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Brooke. I'll give an update on uh, COVID-19 activity in Genesis Health System today. Today, we have 29 patients in Genesis with COVID-19. 
Uh, we have uh, 11 of the 29 in our intensive care units. Uh, if we look back uh, one month ago, uh, we had four uh, COVID-19 patients in our hospital. So obviously we've seen an increasing trend over the past month. Uh, the thing that I would report out uh, in addition to the COVID patients, which represent currently 11% of our inpatient census, our overall volumes are high across the health system. Uh, we're running uh, more than 20% above our expected volumes uh, at this time. So the, the addition of the 29 patients and especially the 11 patients in the intensive care unit are uh, putting a strain on our ability to care for all the patients, COVID and non-COVID across the health system. The intensive care unit patients bear a special mention because of the fact that they have very high intensity levels of care requiring uh, very, um, very low staffing ratios, many of them a one-to-one -one or two-to-one nursing ratio, and they have very long lengths of stay in the ICU. So uh, that, uh, although we certainly have not seen uh, the uh, total numbers that we were seeing last November, when you take the numbers that we have, plus the uh, demand on our intensive care unit and our overall volumes, we're experiencing a very similar strain uh, that impacts healthcare across our community. I would just add the same message. Uh, we strongly encourage everyone who is not currently vaccinated to receive the vaccine. It's readily available in the community. At Genesis, we have it in our primary care clinics, our urgent care clinics, and at our Elmore Avenue location, which is open uh, twice weekly. Uh, so there's uh, ready access to the vaccine in our community. I would also echo the fact that we need to uh, continue to mask at all times that we're indoors, whether you're vaccinated or not, uh, during this current uh, increase in COVID activity and spread across our community. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. Appreciate you being here. Next, we'll hear from Unity Point Health Trinity. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Bob Erickson, the CEO. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks, everybody, for um, uh, hearing us, letting us tell our story a little bit. I remember it wasn't that long ago when the vaccines rolled out, and there was just palpable joy throughout the organization uh, that we were going to get by this. Um, and uh, uh, we had great success rolling it out. And we seem to hit a brick wall with a uh, number of people in our communities that want to get vaccinated. Um, with that, our numbers continued to go down. And much like Dr. Anderson reported, I think it was six weeks ago uh, at Unity Point, for the first time in over 400 days, we had zero um, inpatients with COVID. Then we started seeing the outbreaks um, in Southern Illinois, Missouri. We started to learn more about how infectious the Delta variant is. Um, and we started seeing a surge again. And, and I can confirm at this point, it's looking like a third surge. Um, just in the last week, I just wanna share with you our numbers. We currently have 41 inpatients um, with COVID-19, which is the highest we've had since um, March. Um, the percent of our positive tests in our clinics week over week has increased by 8%. Um, we're up to almost 20% positivity rate testing several hundred suspected COVID patients a day again. Um, the number of inpatient positive COVID-19 uh, patients has increased over the past week. Um, last week, we were averaging 19 per day, this week, 32. And again, right now, we're up to 41. Uh, and then the number of daily admissions has doubled um, in a week where it's, we're admitting almost four a day again. So, you know, the other thing I will say, and Dr. Dirk will be talking about the medical profile and what we're seeing is this comes at a time when we all talk about workforce recovery and healthcare coming out of a difficult year and everybody's facing the same thing where we've lost a lot of nurses, we've lost a lot of respiratory therapists and every healthcare system is facing that. So this surges in our region um, and we're seeing a lot of other non-COVID illness, whether it's RSV or, or just patients that maybe have put out their care We've got really sick people, and so the, the systems are strained. This is going to continue to climb. We've got to get people vaccinated, um, and we've got to continue to do the right things to make sure our communities are safe. The average age right now of our inpatients with COVID is 43. Um, the average age of those that are testing positive in our clinics is 32. Um, and so you can see the impact is, uh, continues to be on, on everybody um, in the population. So with that, I will uh, ask Dr. Durek, who's our chief of staff, uh, president of our medical staff, to maybe give a little flavor of uh, the medical profile, what we're seeing. 
Yeah, thanks, Bob, and, and thanks everybody for this important uh, meeting and message. I'll echo what we've heard from all of our other guests. I mean, this is vitally important that our community um, gets the message that this is an absolutely serious situation for us in this community. We, we recovered, we started to recover, we started to take care of people again um, that were non-COVID patients, and now we're back focused on very sick, younger patients that are presenting to, to our hospitals, putting a major stress and strain on our system. All of our doctors and, and nurses and clinical staff um, are maxed out, and we're coming into a busy season now with respiratory illness, RSV and flu. We always see a, an uptick in, in fall and winter with these, and so this is going to complicate things, uh, and we need the community support and vaccination and social distancing and masking. It's worked before. It will work again. And we have to um, uh, stress the importance of, of both the vaccine and masking and social distancing. The other comment I will make is, uh, as a radiologist, we're starting to see more and more of the long COVID uh, images and symptoms of uh, syncope, fatigue, shortness of breath. And so there's a real risk that uh, some people will not get completely better. And so attacking this on, on the front of vaccine is the only way to go. Thank you so much, Dr. Durek, as well. Um, I don't yet have any questions in the chat. I'll give it here a second and see if we have any from our media partners on the call. Um, in the meantime, perhaps we could have Dr. Katz or one of our physicians um, address. We've been talking with some of our partners about how Delta has really been a change in the game for us. Is there something, Dr. Katz, that you could help our community understand how what we were looking at at the beginning of July is not where we're at now as a community? Well, um, there's a lot of a lot of work ongoing with Delta. Obviously, what we know for sure is it's in a range of three to five times more transmissible than the prior variants. There's a lot of argument about whether it makes people sicker, and I, that'll get sorted out. Um, it's it's not clearly making people sicker. It is clearly putting a younger group of patients in the hospital. Uh, and I'm aware of a death in a 20 odd year old uh, in the region uh, very recently. Um, so the, the issue becomes when, when something that is that much more uh, contagious, CDC has compared it to chicken pox. When something's that much more contagious, the re requirement to start approaching herd immunity when there are enough immune people in the population to keep the virus from spreading becomes a much more difficult problem where we were hoping that 70 or 75% would have done it. We're probably in the 85 to 90% uh, range for required vaccinations uh, to really push down the spread of this variant. And remember, this is the current variant, not uh, the last one. Both sides of the river, the immunization rate in the population, right around 50%. So we need, uh, we need people in lines uh, for vaccine. And it's critical that that happen as quickly as possible uh, because it takes uh, five to six weeks for uh, immunity to maximize and school starting over the next several weeks all across the region. Um, there was a follow-up question on variants. Are there others besides Delta that we're currently concerned about in the medical community? Well, Delta is the biggie. It's the variant of concern. There are other variants of concern, but they're not doing a lot. And when you look at data on the Quad Cities, um, the sequencing being done at uh, public health labs, it's all Delta right now. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's all Delta. So we are concerned about other variants, uh, but um, both nationwide and particularly in our community, uh, Delta is the issue. Um, and vaccination is a solution, both to Delta and to subsequent variants. Uh, the efficacy of the vaccines may start to drop either because the variants are different or because a lot of people are getting further and further away from their original series. Uh, the vaccines are not going to stop being effective suddenly. I'm pretty confident of that. So uh, whether it's Delta or Lambda or Omega, somewhere down the line, the, the, we get out of this by vaccinating. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question here. I'll start with um, Dr. Anderson. Questions about vaccinated or unvaccinated. We were discussing this just yesterday. If you could give us a little understanding for those who are hospitalized. And I know you also pointed out um, with older adults in terms of maybe under vax, vax because or under immunized because of uh, the inability for that vaccine to take as great a hold there. Maybe you could just give us some understanding about what that's looking like generally. Yeah, I would. The, the pattern is held that we've seen since we've been vaccinating that the vast majority of patients who are uh, very sick and end up hospitalized are the unvaccinated population. So we are seeing majority of our patients being unvaccinated. The, the breakthrough vaccinated patients uh, certainly are in the more high risk group, elderly group, um, or those who may have uh, comorbid conditions that uh, put them at higher risk. So the, the message I would give is that uh, the vast majority of our cases have continued to be in the unvaccinated population. Anything you'd like to add from Unity Point, either Dr. Durek or Bob? So I can give you the numbers. Until very recently, it was almost zero um, vaccinated uh, that were hospitalized. Lately, we've seen an increase. So I think out of the 41 we have today, I believe eight um, are vaccinated. They kind of fall into the same category. They're immunocompromised. They might have other uh, underlying health conditions. Um, they might not have been fully vaccinated. And they tend to not end up in the ICU. They, they're sick enough to get hospitalized, treated, and uh, they do better. So we have seen an uptick. Um, and people that have been vaccinated that are ending up in the hospital. I know, Dr. Durek, if you have any comments. No, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I think the message really is, is that uh, the likelihood that you're gonna get very sick and end up in an ICU or ventilated is incredibly low in a vaccinated patient. Like there's some questions about bake, breakthrough cases, which I think is referring to those who were vaccinated. So I think you've addressed that. I know you don't want to get into any too specifics in terms of specific individuals and ages, but can you discuss some of those younger who are hospitalized? We can start with Dr. Durek, if you're able to give us any kind of background on that generally. Um, yeah, all I can really say is that, you know, like, like Bob suggested, we, we have uh, an average age of you know, high 30s to low 40s of, of the inpatient census. And so we're seeing um, younger patients, unvaccinated patients that are, are sick and being hospitalized for COVID. And I would just add, we've seen, you know, um, very young uh, in their 20s who've ended up um, on ventilators. Um, I will say besides the staffing crisis, I think the medical community is much better prepared um, to treat. And so, you know, we're seeing better outcomes with those type of patients where they tend to do better, get off the vent. Um, so there's some real progress in terms of treatment. Our biggest concern right now is, is capacity, but we've seen pretty much all ages at this point um, hospitalized. Um, we try obviously with pediatrics to get them to a children's hospital, um, but uh, the children's hospitals all around us are pretty much full at this point. So th there's a lot to be concerned about in terms of this uh, kind of surge of COVID and non-COVID patients we're seeing throughout our region and throughout our country. The last question on here, and perhaps I can just open it up to whoever um, would like to respond. Why the uptick in breakthrough cases requiring hospitalization now? Yeah, this is Cass. People are unvaccinated. The, you saw the epidemic curve that counts infected individuals. A proportion of infected individuals get sick. The more infected individuals there are, the more infected individuals will get sick enough to wind up in the hospital. Not rocket science. We're in a surge. The increase in cases in the Quad Cities is exponential um, and shows no signs of slowing now over a period of observation of several weeks. Um, we have the opportunity to blunt this if people will get vaccinated mask in enclosed spaces um, and socially distance. If we don't, we'll be where Texas, Florida, Louisiana, Georgia and Alabama are in, um, in a short period of time. Uh, we'll, be, we'll need then to talk about curtailing acute medical services that are even slightly elective. And we'll be talking about lockdowns again um, uh, in the near future. Uh, it's really simple math. A fraction of, of all those people on the epidemic curve are going to get sick enough to need care, wind up in the hospital, 
in the ICU on a ventilator and die. Dr. Katz, another question. Um, perhaps you can explain how additional doses of vaccine work. The question is, would people who don't get a third shot eventually lose all protection from their first two doses, or how does that third dose support immunity? Well, you're asking for, um, for information we really don't understand yet. There are early signs that the people who were immunized first are starting to be less protected to see more infections and even a little bit more uh, illness. So the feds are moving very quickly uh, on this recommendation for September that people um, immunized early get a booster dose. Um, but the immune system isn't as simple as measuring an antibody level and the data is not mature. In point of fact, uh, I was immunized in, uh, completely Im immunized by mid-February. So I'm six months plus or minus uh, out. Uh, and I'm sure my antibody levels are lower now than they were at peak. But the immune system has a memory. So if I'm exposed to the virus tomorrow, even though my antibodies are lower now than they were then, the immune memory cells will respond and my antibody levels uh, will get boosted. I'm not convinced yet of how many people are going to need boosters in the short run. Certainly the immunocompromised, that data is pretty good. I suspect those in long-term care facilities, primarily elderly and multiple comorbidities, their immune systems just don't work as well as yours and mine. Uh, so long-term care and immunocompromised, high on my list for boosters. Everybody else, I think the data is not yet compelling. And then for that third dose for the immunocompromised, do we assume that that brings them up to the same level of protection against COVID of those who are not immunocompromised? Well, if you look at the transplant literature, the solid organ transplant, kidneys and livers and that sort of thing, uh, it, there's, there's a large percentage, maybe half, of those people that might not respond optimally to the first two doses. And when you give them the third dose, about half of them get up to a level that we're pretty happy with. Not perfect, but it's much better. And it's based on those data uh, that ACIP has recommended boosters uh, for the immunosuppressed, using transplant patients as, as the exemplary cohort. It will be different for people with leukemia it will be different for people with rheumatoid disease who are on disease modifying agents, uh, but we don't have all that data. So we're being aggressive with the immunocompromised uh, um, and we're generalizing from transplantation uh, to all the severely immunocompromised people. Dr. Anderson or Dr. Durek, um, does the medical community have an idea, and I'm sure this is uncomfortable trying to uh, look into the future, but an idea when this surge may peak? <laughs> well, uh, you, you know, you can look at the modeling data, but it really will depend on what uh, behaviors occur in our community as to whether it prolongs and continues to rise or whether it uh, starts to plateau and then come back down. So uh, I, I want to be optimistic, but uh, I'm not in the prognostication game. Maybe Dr. Katz can give us his uh, assessment of the curves, but uh, it looks like it's going to be a bit. Yeah, well, I did the high V test yesterday, and I am not optimistic. I went into high V, and I was the only one there at a reasonably busy time with a mask on. So that's why we're we're not just talking about vaccination. Masking and distancing works and people need to start doing it or we're going to be in deep trouble. And remember, we're about to start school again and um, and we don't this year have mask mandates in the Iowa schools. And then last question that we'll take for today. Oh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to speak, you know, so that's one of the reasons we're so concerned. So the models that we look at, and they change every day because the data points change every day, right? And, and as Dr. Anderson and Kat said, I mean, behaviors aren't changing. So um, this is an infectious variant. Um, you know, initially, we looked at uh, this could 
peak out like the third week of September, which for us is beginning, although flu might come earlier, but that's all off the table at this point because it's incrementally every week going up and up and up and up. So it's really hard to say when this will stop. I think that's on all of us as a community to, to determine that by our behaviors. Thank you. And the last question that we'll be able to respond to today, um, Dr. Katz, perhaps you can expect or can address this. Do we know how effective this third dose will be against other variants out there? That's an easy one. No. <laughs> uh, the virus drifts slowly uh, and we've gone from wild type to alpha uh, to delta in our community and, and the changes in vaccine efficacy have been uh, pretty modest. Uh, I hope that that's what we see uh, moving forward, but I, I really can't predict that. Thank you. Thank you to our media partners for joining us today. Um, we are grateful for any support you can provide in sharing this information um, on behalf of all of our agencies and our other partners of the QC COVID-19 Coalition. Uh, we are recording this, so if you do need a recording, please let us know. We will be posting it on our social media pages and websites, uh, so it will be there if you should need anything later on. And we also will be following up with a written press release with some information and names and all of that that you can use as well. Thank you to our partners, Dr. Durek, Bob, Dr. Katz, uh, Dr. Anderson. We're grateful that you were here today. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and for all of your work in uh, supporting our community during these continued challenging times. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.